Recommended name in racquetball presents Playing Smart, featuring eight of the world's best racquetball players. Five time world champion Mike Yellen, Time world champion Lynn Adams. Nineteen eighty eight national champion Ruben Gonzalez. National champion, Drew Ketchtick. Nineteen ninety, nineteen ninety one national champion, Michelle Gilman. champion, Tim Sweeney. Two-time amateur champion, Tim Doyle. Gold medalist, Tournament of the Americas, Lynn Coburn. so let's start with the part of the game where we score our points, the serve. When you have possession of the serve, you are in control of the start of the rally. You dictate the speed, direction, and height of the serve, and your opponent has to wait to try to figure out what is coming. You want to stay clear on what your intentions are, and your basic strategy is to set up a three-shot rally and to keep your opponent off balance. The way that you accomplish this is by using the whole box. You should hit serves from three or four locations in the service box. Each time you vary your position, you create a different serve at a different angle. The 
The second key is to keep your motion the same. You want to keep your opponent in the dark about what serve you're going to hit. Don't give him hints on how you use your body and how you step into the ball. So step in the same direction, bounce the ball in the same area, and use your racket face to change direction of the serve. Tim Doyle has one of the most feared serves in the pro game today, and here are three great examples of how he keeps his motion the same and changes his serve by his wrist and the direction of his racket face. The third key is to hit a variety of serves from each serve spot. How many serves depends on how far you want to take this idea. Ruben is going to show us the four basic drive type serves from spot number three in the service box, starting with the drive to the left. Then from the same place, he can do a drive to the right. For more variation, he can do a Z to the left and then follow that up with a jam into the person's body. So right now, he has four different serves from the same place in the box. Remember, it's important to keep your opponent off balance, so you want to vary your serves from more than one place in the box. As we watch Ruben hit the same serves from position number one, keep in mind you can really run with this idea. Add more serves to each spot, and you can cause your opponent to feel hesitant and confused. Tim is now showing us the fourth key, which is the subtle art of varying the speed of your serve. By changing pace on your serves, you intensify the element of keeping your opponent off balance. A hard drive serve countered with a change of pace drive serve gives you two serves for the price of one. A hard Z serve will bite the side wall when it hits and rebound towards the center of the court. A change of pace Z will roll backwards towards the back wall, creating a whole new serve for your opponent to contend with. Let's recap our four key strategies for an effective service game. First, use the whole service box. Move around and maximize your angles. Second, keep your motion the same so that you don't give away what serve you're hitting. Third, hit a variety of serves. And last, vary the speed of your serves to keep your opponent off balance. The lob is a crucial element to any one service game. You should vary your lob serves with the same intent that you vary your hard serves. Whether you hit high lobs or half lobs, Z lobs or lobs into the side wall, the intent remains the same. Force a weak return and keep your opponent off balance. You can also lob off at different motions. Here Ruben starts off with a high lob motion and then hits a lower half lob, forcing his opponent to wait another split second before reacting. With his second lob, he starts with a lower half lob, then changes into a high lob. The end result keeps his opponent a little off balance. So how do you choose the right serve? First, be aware of your opponent's strengths and weaknesses. Chip away at his strengths and attack his weakness when you really need the point. Second, be brutally honest about your strengths and weaknesses. The sign of a good player is one that sticks with what he knows best. Third, assess how the match is going. Keep a running tab in your head of what has worked and what has fallen short. Go with what works. Practice is an obvious step to bettering your racquetball skills. Practicing with a goal in mind makes the time you spend more productive and fun. When you are working on your serves, make the time count. Get really specific about putting the ball into the right place over and over and over. Visual aids can help you increase your consistency level. Well-placed targets get you in the habit of hitting crisp, effective serves. Can you hit six out of 10 good serves down the line? The jam serve is fast becoming a favorite weapon on the Pro Tour. A cardboard box is an excellent target to shoot for. If you can put the ball in the box, you know you've handcuffed your opponent and hit a good jam serve. drive serve needs to be low and right over the short line so you don't give your opponent a setup off the back wall. A bag is a great target to aim for and you should practice with the goal of being precise and striving for perfection. When I serve, I try to emulate a good baseball pitcher and like a pitcher I work the opponent, showing them different serves at different speeds. 
I want to try to stay one step ahead of the receiver and get inside their head as quickly as possible. Because if I can work my way into their head and keep them off balance and slightly confused, then the rest of the game becomes a lot easier. I'm known for analyzing my opponent's weaknesses. I concentrate on making my serve force my opponent to hit a weak return. If I've hit my serve properly, I'll get a weak return and I'll put my next shot away. And now let's talk about the return of serve. The strategy of the serve return is to counter the offensive advantage of the server. So let's take a look at several different ways to accomplish that. One of the biggest hints the server will give you is how they step into the serve. If you see an open stance, it's an indication that a cross-court serve may be coming your way. A closed stance creates an easier angle to hit a down-the-line serve. Here Michelle demonstrates how the server's upper body can also give you clues. Michelle's shoulders open up towards the front wall on her drive cross-court. But she keeps her shoulders facing more to the side wall on her serve to the right. See if you can guess which direction Michelle is going to serve on this next sequence. This close-up of the server's feet gives us a good view of an open and closed stance. Practice reading the server by watching a tournament match or a workout. See if you can predict where the serve is going before the serve is actually hit. The better the player, the tougher it gets. But pick up on any subtle clues that you can and use them to your advantage. Your foot movement towards the serve can dictate whether you get set up for the return or you are off balance for the return. If the serve is hit to your left, your first motion towards the ball will be a slight pivot or hop. You'll then take a small step with your left foot, plant it, then make a crossover motion as you step into the shot. A serve to your right requires the hop and a small step with your right foot. Try to get turned sideways so that you can use your whole body to come in behind the shot. To select the proper return, you need to consider two areas. First, the server's court position, and second, your opponent's strengths and weaknesses. In the following sequences, Michelle will capitalize on Lynn's shallow court position. Michelle chooses a down-the-line pass mainly because Lynn has barely gotten out of the service box. The ball shoots by Lynn before she can react. The second sequence is similar in that Lynn's position is too far forward. Michelle quickly notices and takes advantage of Lynn's shallow court position. Michelle's crossover step gives her power from her legs and body. Michelle hits a great cross-court pass before Lynn has time to set up. While you want to be aggressive on your serve return, sometimes the shot just isn't there. A ceiling ball can get you out of a jam and back into a rally. If you feel off balance or you're just not executing your shots that day, hit a ceiling ball and wait for a better setup. A kill shot is the ultimate return. If you hit a kill shot properly, that will end the rally. The idea is to hit your kill shots with consistency by not skipping any balls. It is so ingrained in us as players to hit the ball away from our opponent, but every now and then we can surprise them by hitting it right at them. If the server doesn't back out of the box far enough, they have less reaction time and are vulnerable to the jam shot. The Skycam shot gives us a great perspective of how your opponent's court positioning can affect your choice of returns. By not getting back into a good center court position, the server is vulnerable to passes, ceiling balls, and jam shots. Take the time to notice where your opponent's position is and then take advantage of their mistakes. An effective strategy as the receiver is to turn the tables on the server and put them on the defense immediately. One way to do that is to cut off the Z serve. It's an advanced shot that's tough to control because you hit the ball at chest high, but a necessary shot at the advanced level. Another table turner is the short hop. As the receiver, don't let your opponent control the pace of the rally by keeping you in the backcourt with the lob serve. Move up and short hop the ball. Your opponent will have less time to get into position and you will have put them on the defense allowing you to regain control. 
The sky cam shows Michelle cutting off the Z before Lynn even has a chance to get out of the service box. That's aggressive racquetball. The short hop is used so often at the advanced level that not being able to hit the shot puts you at a disadvantage. The short hop allows you to take control of the pace of the rally and quickly puts pressure on your opponent. Practicing your return of serve is tricky because you can't do it by yourself. The only way to work on it is to have someone serve to you. An effective and fun way to practice is the serve, serve return drill. The game is played to 11 points and you only play two shots. You will either be the server or the receiver for the whole 11 point game. That way you focus on one skill at a time. As the receiver, if you hit a good ceiling, pass, or kill shot, you win the point. As the server, if your serve is tough enough to stop a good return, you win the point. Alternate positions after each 11 point game. When returning serve, I must have confidence that I can return any serve that my opponent may hit. My mental approach is to be as offensive as possible without making any mistakes. I know what shots I can execute with success, but I must also hit a variety of shots to keep my opponents off balance. I'm constantly talking to myself and hyping myself up to hit the best return I can. I'm going to make it happen, whatever it takes. I'm very aggressive on my returns, and attitude is everything. Now, the rally. The key to winning a rally is maintaining center court position. You may have the best backhand in the world, but if you're out of position, you won't get to use it. Getting good court position means controlling center court, but just exactly where is center court? It takes up an area mostly behind the five foot line. In fact, the pros like to call it the floating center court because you move around within that sphere depending on where the ball is. If the ball is close to the left wall, you will move slightly to the left of center court. As the ball moves to the right, so do you. By playing this area, you are set up to get most of the balls most of the time. This lighted area is called the dead zone or no man's land. When you play this area, you are too far forward. Passing shots and ceiling balls will shoot by you quickly, putting you on the defense. Your first opportunity to dominate center court is right after you serve. Tim Sweeney, known for his quick feet, shows us all the right moves for getting out of the box and into good court position. By getting back behind the five foot line, he sets himself up to get to most shots. A majority of service returns are passing shots, ceiling balls, and missed kill attempts. Center court theory dictates that you want to be in the position that gives you the highest percentage chance of getting to the ball. This positioning behind the five foot line does just that. When you hit your lob serves, don't let the slowness of the serve lull your feet to sleep. In fact, mentally think the opposite. Think fast feet. Get out of the box and into position before your opponent strikes the ball. Drew Catchstick is a master at lob serves, and he uses them specifically to have time to get into a dominant court position. As he serves to the right, he moves smoothly out of the box, taking over the right side of the floating center court area. This is our famous sky cam shot, and it effectively shows Tim moving out of the service box and into center court. A common error of players is not getting far enough out of the box. They stop their position right behind the short line and instantly become vulnerable to some of the most commonly hit shots, meaning the passing shot, the ceiling ball, and any ball that comes right at them off the front wall. The pros know how important good court positioning is and they have fast feet. Think how much of a difference good court positioning will mean to those of us who aren't so quick. Once the rally starts, learning to react before your opponent hits the ball will give you a definite edge. It's called anticipation. 
Your opponent will give you clues as to where he's going to hit his shot. This first sequence shows us an example of what happens when the ball gets off behind Drew's body. His racket strings will naturally face towards the sidewall, resulting in a predictable pinch. Anticipating the pinch, Tim has moved up to cover the shot and win the rally. This second sequence illustrates what happens when the ball is out in front of your body. The natural direction of the racket face hits the ball cross court. A pinch shot would be out of the question. Anticipating the cross court, Tim is on the ball, controlling the rally. Here, Drew is looking to see if Tim will hit a ceiling ball or drive the ball down from his shoulder. The ceiling ball motion indicates that it's time to get out of center court and into deep court to set up for the next shot. As the players switch places, Drew can be pretty sure that Tim is not going to hit a ceiling ball on this shot. On this last sequence, Drew should be on his toes ready to move forward because Tim is going to drive down on the ball going for the low kill shot. Because racquetball is such a fast game, how you move your feet becomes crucial. Tim and Drew are both known for their quickness and retrieving ability. In this sequence, just watch their feet. Notice the smooth step-together step motion they use to get into position. They stay on their toes and are constantly in motion. A lot of us get in trouble when we relax and stand flat-footed. Then all of a sudden, we have to chase down a 130 mile per hour pass shot and we wonder why we can't get set up properly. Stay on your toes, keep moving, and think fast. There are so many variables to this game that there is no way we can always be set up in the right place every time. In this shot, Drew demonstrates the art of faking. Tim has an easy setup in front court, but Drew will aggressively try to get another chance at the ball. By moving to the left, Drew is telling Tim, go ahead, hit down the line. As soon as Tim locks his eyes on the ball, Drew reverses his motion and covers the court he had left wide open. You can have a lot of fun with faking and get inside your opponent's head. First they see you, then they don't. Be aggressive when your opponent has an easy setup and fake him out of the point. Another tactic to use when you're out of position is learning to move with your opponent's racket swing. There is a timing element involved, but if you wait until after they have completed their swing, many times it is too late to have a chance at retrieving the ball. As with any other aspect of the game, practice is the key to improving your footwork and positioning skills. A good drill to focus your attention to these two areas is the hit and move drill. The goal of this drill is to hit your shot and then immediately move to center court. All too often we hit, watch the ball, and then move. Learn how to move and watch at the same time. Tim and Drew never stop moving their feet and are constantly moving back towards center court after they hit the ball. Good court positioning is a major step in controlling and winning a match. A quick recap of the rally strategies include the following. Number one, get out of the service box and into center court. Don't get stuck in no man's land. Two, read your opponent and notice where the ball is in relation to his body and what his feet and shoulders are doing. Three, move in a smooth step together step and stay on your toes. Four, be aggressive when you're out of position. Don't wait for your opponent to make a mistake, force him to make the mistake. And fifth, Hit and move. The Skycam illuminates the player's constant foot movement and focus on controlling center court. My objective is to be as offensive as possible during all rallies, keeping my opponent on the defense. If I'm able to execute my shots properly, then I'll have the confidence to finish off my opponent. Staying mentally tough has been a trademark of mine throughout my entire career and has helped me win many tournaments and championships. So during any match or workout, stay focused, have fun, and win. Determination and tenacity can take me a long way in a match. I never, ever give up. Just because my opponent scored eight points in a row doesn't mean I'm finished. Who says I can't come back and score the next eight? I play each rally with a fierce determination, and I believe I can win all the way to the very last point. When I'm in a jam, I focus less on the score and more on winning one rally at a time. 
you will be amazed at how sheer willpower can turn a match around in your favor. Above all, I have fun when I play. Win or lose, I love this game. There's no question that these strategies are going to help you elevate the level of your game. But just like you, I'm always looking for that extra advantage. I think that one of the tips from these pros is going to give you the edge that you're looking for. What I would do is about three times a week is I would take a bucket of balls down, just hit them by myself. One bucket would take me about a half hour. I would just practice my serves, and I'd hit about three buckets a night. The way I see it as a tournament player, a great serve is the most important thing, because one ace equals one point. I feel one of the most important things in practice that I do by myself is I practice uh, with the same intensity I play with in tournaments. So I know when I'm in a tournament and they put me in that situation where I need to rally, I'm comfortable, I have the confidence because I've done it enough times throughout practice. I think that practicing my skills over and over again are uh, what's made me a good player. I usually practice most of my skills from deep court because most of the rallies are played in that area. So by practicing deep court play, it makes it more similar to a match. And I think that by repeating my skills over and over, I think that that's one of the reasons that I'm a good player today. The key to my success is ball control. And it all begins right here on the practice court. I want to maintain center court position for a longer period of time than my opponent. Here, let me show you. You have center court position right here. If I hit 90% of my shots into these back corners of the court, these back cubes, my shots will never travel through the center court position. That will allow me to gain, maintain this position for a longer period of time than my opponent. If I do this properly throughout the course of the match, I will do less running than my opponent and generally win the match. that makes my workout special are these ankle weights. I use the weights to uh, get me quicker, to be quick on the court, to be flexible, to develop my legs, my power on the legs, uh, to feel a lot of confidence and speed movement around the court. A lot of times, uh, a lot of players will wait for the ball. Myself, because of the weights, I anticipate and I'm right on top of the ball at all times. I know these weights have made me quicker and a better player. important things for me is nutrition. That starts out in the morning with a good breakfast, and all through the day you want to be drinking water. You don't want to eat too close to your practice session and be playing on full stomach. Uh, one of the most important things is water after your match. Uh, we all know fundamentals is great, and practice is the most important, but the way I see it, if you're not eating right, you're not going to be playing right. I am an extremely competitive person, and that competitive fire has really helped me in my career and has hurt me a couple times in my career. So when I'm out on the court practicing, I feel real strongly that I need to practice my emotional control. And there are certain ways that I do that. One of them is, is that I imagine a variety of situations that could happen in a tournament situation. Whether that be I'm having problems with the referee, uh, maybe I think that my opponent is cheating, picking up double bounces and not calling them. Maybe I'm just not playing at the skill level that I think that I should be playing at. Whatever is frustrating me, I deal with it off the court first. I sit down with a book in my hand and I write down every way that I could possibly handle that situation. And then I pick the one that I think is going to work best for me and my personality. So what I'm doing is I'm practicing the situation so that when it happens in real life in a tournament, it doesn't surprise me, it doesn't freak me out, and I can deal with it. So if you ask me about the mental part of the game, I'm going to tell you that the mental side of the game is no different than the physical side of the game. You have to practice it. We play a little small ball and Tim, how does it feel to be about the second best small ball player in the country? Uh, well, actually, I think uh, this racket, I just won the national championships, and we have it on film. Actually, you 
know, it helps with foot speed. You gotta stay on your toes because it's such a quick game. You're playing it up front, always moving. You're really never in dead time. It's it's uh, it's really tough to kill the ball, so everything's always in play. A lot of moving. It's maybe a small court, but it's un it's very surprising how much you're gonna move out there. As Tim will show you on the film, how he's diving. I had no problem killing the ball. All of us want to improve the level of our game. And playing smart is a great way to get there. So take these tips and strategies and go out and be the best player you can be. Because the better you are, the more fun you'll have. Playing Smart was produced and directed by Lee Belsmo and Tate at the Merritt Athletic Club in Annapolis, Maryland. Ectalon is the official sponsor of the AARA, the American Amateur Racquetball Association. Ectalon, the most recommended name in racquetball.